Welcome to this week's issue of Break Time With. Today I am speaking with Mark Davis of Blue Apple. Really, really, Mark, do you want me to say Blue Apple or Blue Apple? Blue Apple Education. Is, Blue Apple Education. Yeah, if that's okay, yeah. Okay. Welcome to this week's issue of the Friday Club Break Time With interview feature. This week, I'm really looking forward to speaking with Mark Davis of Blue Apple Education. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. No, thanks for having me, Sophie. Great to be here. Really pleased that you are here. For us, it's really, really interesting to have a marketing and admissions expert who's working across the MAT sector as well as independent international schools. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your expertise with us today. No problem. With, with my virtual school experience hat on, I know that there is an increasing focus on marketing in the math sector here in the UK and that you're heavily involved with maths. Is that your experience too? Um, yeah, I think slowly but surely, um, I think that the math sector is, um, is certainly waking up to developing sort of a strategic approach to marketing that we that you'll have seen in the independent and international markets um, and they've started sort of drawing on the experience of marketing consultants and trying to bring in that professionalism um, and I think that's largely been driven by their development of a of a growth strategy so lots and lots of maths now approaches in a different way so they'll be talking to us about the challenges they're facing in terms of their own growth and they've got this very clear ideas as to where they want to be in 12 months three years five years and that's a big shift if we're honest I think prior to that very often in in the state sector um, marketing was very much product focused we'd be approached by people that would literally tell us we need a new prospectus we need a new website we need a new promotional film and it would be up to us to sort of take them back a few steps to understand the motivation behind why we're being approached for a particular product because there was a lack of strategy there very often it was well we've got an old website so we need a new one that's you know okay well maybe that's the reason why the conversation has started but that's not what you need a website to do what's it what's it designed to to achieve what does it need to what, the, what you know what do you need it to happen so i think slowly but surely yes there is there is a strategic approach that's developing i'd say it's in its infancy sophie if i'm honest yeah. um, and it will develop over time is this for anybody listening that might be coming across blue apple education for the first time would you like to tell us a bit more about what you do for maths that are approaching you with these sorts of questions? Yeah, that might help, might it? We're um, so we're a, we're a creative design company, um, and we work exclusively within education. So all of our clients are schools and colleges and multi academy trusts. We do work across both sectors, so we do have clients in the independent sector, some international schools, um, mainly in the UK, but we also do have clients in North America, Europe. The, the Middle East. So we're a we're a small team, uh, really focused. Again, as I've just mentioned, really on that helping schools strategize what they do, uh, and really getting to grips with what a school needs from its marketing and communications, what a trust needs from marketing and communications, and understanding that. Um, so again, our approach is is not really product focused. We deliver school websites and prospectuses and promotional films. Uh, logo and branding projects and anything that a school or a, a trust needs to market or communicate but we do that very much from a results driven perspective so we're really looking at making sure that what we deliver is designed to achieve what the client effectively needs it to do wonderful so i bet you have some really interesting conversations then with schools about what results they'd like to achieve yeah are there any specific key issues or focuses for maths right now in terms of marketing and admissions that you come across frequently yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. There there's definitely some common themes there um something that that crops up all the time actually uh, and is, is probably a hangover from a historical development of multi-academy trusts is is around those sort of public perceptions of of what a mat is um and why it exists so uh, sometimes the work that we do really is is helping people get a handle on having a louder voice than 
you know, the, the British press, the British press have loved to jump on the negatives of multi-academy trust, the, the well-publicised massive salaries of a CEO. You know, they're just easy stories to jump on and they're a, a drop in the ocean when you compare the wonderful work that multi-academy trusts have, have done across the UK. So that's certainly one, one aspect. Um, but I think another one really has been the recognition since COVID really of a need for a move towards a, a, a sort of a, a digital offering for, for parents. And that's been really key. Um, they've sort of woken up to the idea that without being able to get parents through the door, very similar to, I'm sure, as you've seen in the independent sector. Yeah. Um, they've really needed to offer parents an alternative to that. Um, and I think what's interesting is that that now um, has become commonplace and will remain. It, it's not going to go away. And even with all the restrictions being lifted with the COVID, even now parents can still visit, there's a recognition that actually we can be marketing this school 24 seven. Um, parents can access this busy discerning parents looking to make a decision could actually be hearing a message from the head teacher and, and looking at our school at half past 11 at night and, and seeing that visual representation of, of who we are. Um, really? Yeah. It sounds like it's accelerated the strategy and the planning for a lot of the academy trusts that you work with. Yeah. Again, I think similar to, to independent, I think they, it, it, it I think it, I think COVID accelerated lots of things. Uh, it certainly moved technology on, changed my life, changed the way that I, I, I talk to schools. Um, I, I went from 32,000 miles a year to, I think I did 250 miles during. Yeah, crazy. And, and, and still talking to as many schools, probably speaking to more schools and developing stronger relationships with them because we talk more often it's easier to jump on a on a zoom call and and, and have that uh, conversation um so i think that, that they're the sort of key issues and then the things that have always been there staff recruitment has always been a you know an issue for those um for multi-academy trusts bums on seats is key it, it's pupil numbers that's what we're all aiming to to solve for them and i think that's the case you know whichever type of school it is whether it is an academy, whether it's an independent school or another type of school. Um, it's, do you think in multi-academy trust, there's also this aspect of the school needing to be attractive to other schools that may consider joining that trust, if that makes sense? Um, whether the schools need to be attractive for that? Um, well, yeah, probably they do. I think the um, lots of the conversations I had, I have with the trusts now are all about that expansion and growth. Um, you know, the 100% academization is is growing uh, in terms of its its pace. It, it will happen. You know, that is the way things are going. Um, you're not going to find schools forming single school academies anymore. It's just not going to happen. So those schools that haven't academized yet are going to be looking for trusts to join or are going to be looking for other schools to form a multi-academy trust with. Um, more often than not now, they're probably looking at an established trust in order to, to gain that, that sort of expertise. Right. So yeah, the trust needs to be attractive to, to the schools that, that want to join it. And I think the key there um, is trusts have recognised recently that it's not just a numbers game. Um, you know, there's the obvious benefit of, of bringing on a school. Well, not always. You could have a struggling school with, with very low pupil numbers, in which case it can be it can be difficult to bring that in financially. But very often schools look at growth and it's a numbers game. It's if we take that school on, we will grow the finances of the trust and we will build and develop, develop the trust. It's much more than that. And I think trusts are becoming really quite discerning about the character and the nature of the schools that they're looking to attract. So they're effectively looking to attract the right school, not just any school. Um, and I think that's key because it's very, very difficult to blend two different ethoses and two different visions and ways of, of work. And you really do need schools that are going to buy into the way that a, that a trust operates and what it believes in and its approach to curriculum, for example. Um, there are those trusts that are really looking for those dynamic head teachers and, and a head teacher that can bring something to the trust um, and bring skills and develop the trust in that way. Um, so yeah, absolutely. A lot of the conversations we have now are, are with trusts asking us, 
how can we do this? How can we look to be the trust of choice? Because, you know, there are three locally and we want to stay local. So there's a limited number of schools that we want to attract. Okay, so do these academy trusts, in your experience, have to find what makes them different to those, I guess, competitors? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, you've got to be careful there, because I think there's a uh, tendency to to try and differentiate for, for the sake of doing it. Uh, um, and that can lead to you really having a sort of false brand messaging and so what's important really perhaps more important than, than differentiation from another trust is that actually you've got uh, a voice that is honest and transparent and true to who the who the trust is um, and that that is done really effectively so the work that we do with trust in terms of their branding um, the first thing that we do really is to we call it unearthing the remarkable um, and it's our well, way of, of sort of getting control of what that looks like. So that's our commitment to a trust, to making sure we understand who they are, what their values are, why they exist. You know, what, what is it that they believe in and what are they trying to achieve um, in an ideal world? What is the, the nature and the character of, of their trust? And then making sure that that is then reflected in the way that they market and the way that they communicate. So the way that they present themselves to the outside world is true to who they are. When you do that, you do by default differentiate yourselves from the competition. It's un very unusual for any one trust to have an identical vision and ethos to, uh, to any other, really. Absolutely. So it's about the mission then and what you stand for. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it has to be. Um, and that's very, very powerful. It, it, it really develops a brand story. So the brand becomes so much more than the visual aspect and the professional look of a trust. It becomes something that you can hang your hat on, really, and that schools can buy into. Um, and that really helps with another question that we get asked by, by trust all the time, which is how do we blend our, our brand character with the individual nature of the schools that, that form our trust? Because it's really important, parents are buying into the nature and the character of an individual school. It's very rare that they're going to buy into the nature and character of a trust. There are a few trusts out there that are very corporate and will kind of um, parachute in their identity onto a school. But I'm not convinced that works. And there are very few of them that have done it effectively. Um, so, you know, that, that having a very clear character can lend itself to giving schools something that they can start to adopt into their own branding and marketing that doesn't um, that doesn't negate their own nature and character in the way they present themselves. Absolutely. So as an individual school, as part of a multi-academy trust, how, how can we balance this idea of marketing as a trust and marketing as an individual school? Do you, is that something that you help trusts with? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's um, it's it's tough, you know. It's it's a real it's a real tough ask. It's probably the hardest thing that, from a marketing point of view, that a trust is going to get to grips with. Um, I think it comes back to what I was I was just talking about there. Really, I think it's the it's finding a common theme that, that the schools can adopt. So the biggest mistake that people make in the education sector about branding is that they try and put everything into that visual aspect of their brand. So as we develop a logo, for example, for a trust or for a school, they'll say, we absolutely love it, but it doesn't quite encapsulate this part of our, of our brand. And it doesn't have to, because you've got so many ways in which your brand is gonna be reflected. Your brand is your logo, but your brand is also your tone of voice and the, uh, and the, you know, the way that you communicate and the way that you market. Yeah. When you found those, when you find those key messages, so you've got your visual identity, but then you've got key messages that really resonate with people. They can become the things that can be um, consistent amongst your schools as well. So your school can have its own character and its own nature, but it can refer back to the values of a trust and talk about the values of a trust when they communicate. And that's how the, the brand of a trust starts to be communicated within the the marketing of that school without ever diluting their own brand so it's quite subtle and it takes a little bit of time and it can be quite painful 
for the trust yeah. to go through because it's quite inward looking and it's quite critical at times. Um, but if you can get a handle on it, really, really powerful, it can really start to pay dividends. Absolutely. And it sounds like a similar challenge to some of the groups of fee paying schools might come across because, you know, they've got individual schools and with a group name. Do you think that there's anything that fee paying schools can learn from the way that multi academy trusts approach marketing and comms? Um, yeah, I do. Actually, I think um, the biggest thing they can learn is a trust in their suppliers. Um, and what I mean by that is that multi academy trusts are in their infancy, you know, there's, there's none of them more than maybe 10 years old. Um, and they were very much involved in developing their trust and developing their curriculum at, uh, for, for many years. So actually, they're really in their infancy in terms of their adoption of strategic marketing and, and how they market their trust. So what they're doing is they're going out to um, to businesses like ourselves and to marketing consultants and, and strategy consultants and um, making demands on those specialists and really drawing on the expertise of those people to provide a solution. So really challenging them to, to provide a solution to them. I think what's happened in the independent marketplace over a number of years is that they've um, they've employed sort of marketing professionals who then want to guide the creative. They, um, it, it seems odd to me that, for example, for a company like yours, that you would employ a professional design business and then dictate how you want the design to look and how you want uh, things. So there's that sort of micromanagement that very often happens in the independent market. And it's a mistake because what you actually really need to do is to make those demands. Look, this is what we need. These are the challenges we face. We need a website that solves the fact that we're 10 pupils short for next September. And I don't really care how it, uh, we're paying you to show us what it should look like. We're paying you to show us what that user journey should be, what the calls to action should be, how we should be presenting ourselves. That is strategically what I need you to, to produce. And I think that's been lost a little bit. Um, not all the time, obviously. I think I'm I'm generalising hugely there, but very often with independent schools, there's that micromanagement that happens that can be that can be a mistake. I think. Yeah. So at Blue Apple Education, you're real experts in supporting schools with websites and branding more generally. Is there an, are there any insights that you would share in terms of what schools should be thinking about as they look to sharpen up their websites for the new school year? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. there's. Um, there's a number of things. The first one would would be to look back at what I mentioned before that the unearthing the remarkable. Quite a simple thing to do, really. So um, make sure you've got a handle on the remarkable and what's what is what makes your school tick. Who are you? What are you about? What's your nature? What's your character? Um, and does everybody agree with that? Ask stakeholders within the school. Ask parents. Ask pupils. Ask the staff. Ask uh, governors ask you know, just ask everybody um, yeah. what do they think is remarkable about the school and make sure that there's the you know there's some consistency to what that looks like and when you've got a handle on it then take a very discerning look at your own website and is that being reflected are you giving off the right first impression someone lands on your home page or on a landing page if you've got some digital marketing happening and is that the first impression that they get are they learning who you are and what you're, you know, what's important about you and why they should consider you as their, their school of choice? Um, and the second thing I'd say is, is then look at how your website is actually driving admissions. Um, and there's a number of elements to that. You've got the, you know, is it wowing people? Are you really knocking their socks off? Do they think this is fabulous? Because they should. Um, is the is is it is there an easy user journey? Are you taking people through a story so that it's a it's doing a sales job and it's convincing? It's winning the hearts and minds of people that visit it. Um, and then are there strong calls to action that are driving those people to make an inquiry to actually engage with the school? And they're the biggest mistakes I see on school websites all the time. Is that they're nicely designed, but from a driving admissions point of view. They, they just don't work, but that's not happening. And a website, I guess, has to cater for so many different audiences that that can be a real challenge for schools across the board. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and that needs to be considered at the front end. 
Um, it, it, that should be included in the, at the briefing stage. So your supplier, whoever you're using to develop a website should be asking those questions. So it should be very, very clear. Um, we are creating a website to satisfy the needs of the following people and they are going to need the following things from the website. And then again, that's up to the design company to solve that for you. Don't, don't dictate to them how that should look. Let them show you how they're going to answer that challenge because they should, you know, they'll have come across it before. If that's what, the, we come across that all the time. Very rarely we get asked a question by a school we've not, we've not heard. That's really interesting. If, if we're talking on that topic of admissions, Mark, what's your take on open days for the new academic year? Do you think that they'll stay virtual? Do you know any schools planning to go back to in-person open days? I think that um, virtual open days are here to stay. And, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I think the um, we've woken up to the idea that we can be selling a school 24 seven and that parents can access that sort of information. So we've produced lots and lots of promotional films for schools. Um, and they were once the, um, you know, they were once something that independent schools could access and, and, and use and actually now more and more state schools, um, literally hundreds of them <laughs> all the time. So they're now existing and, and you know, they sit on a website and parents can, can access that anytime. So I think what you're going to find is there's going to be a blend between the two. I think what that virtual solution and, and some of the things that you guys deliver as well give you the, the opportunity to, to be there all the time and to reach many, many more people. And I think what will happen is that actually the physical visit will become a second step. It would be the next step in the in the process of onboarding a parent and a very nice second step that fits into what is a just a, a bit of a broader process. And one of the things I've spoke to, of course, speaking more with independent and international schools is that they really like the idea that a parent will be a bit warmed up to the culture, what they're going to see when they come in person to visit. And I, I really like that approach for a school that you can give a parent an idea of what they will be expect, what they should expect. Yeah. before they walk in the doors and yeah I really like that um connection yeah I think it helps it. um it helps develop how the brand is presented really um and what I mean by that is if you, your staff can also the staff within the school can also watch that promotional film or can access the the virtual tour and get a get a sense of what goes on and and maybe get a sense of how they should be presenting the school themselves and how they should talk about the school because I think that's something that um, has often been missing is a recognition that a brand is reflected in everybody in the school so the brand is something that's discussed by in a state school it, you might have a marketing manager but very often a head teacher deputy head school business manager that's it maybe some other members of the SLT but very few so teachers don't hear it reception staff don't hear it um, and they're really important part of the branding experience of, of a school. So they need to understand how the school should be presented. So I think it's a great, it's a great development. Well, I can really tell, Mark, that you're really passionate about your work with schools. One of the questions we always like to ask when we wrap up our break time with interviews is what do you enjoy most about working in this sector? Yeah, um, I do love it. Um, I'm, I'm so pleased that you've sensed that I'm enthusiastic <laughs> about it um, because I do love it and, and I've not always worked in the education sector so my background is um, is finance and banking and then um, the print industry and then I came into education uh, late in life I'm older than I look um, and yeah I, I, the sector is I think the there's two things. The, the first one would be that there's a real collaboration within education and suppliers within education that you just don't get in other industries. And it's a genuine want to share information and to share expertise. So since I came into education about six years ago, um, I've not only developed fabulous relationships with, with clients, but also fabulous relationships with other suppliers that in other industries might be considered to be competition or perhaps treading on your toes. And that just doesn't occur in education. We all 
try and work collaboratively. And I think that's down to the motivation of most of us. Most of us want the best outcomes for clients. And if we see an opportunity for another supplier, um, then we're, we're more than happy to bring that supplier in because it's the right thing for our client. It's the right thing for them, them to do. Um, and there's nothing worse than seeing schools spending money on the wrong thing, um, on marketing that's never going to do what they need it to do, um, kind of hoodwinked into doing something that, that isn't right. Um, and the second thing I think is, is results. I'd love seeing... Um, you know, a multi-academy trust that actually has a challenge. We talk a lot about it. We put solutions in place and six months, 12 months later, I can sit in the same office and we've nailed it. We've done it. We've got to where we needed to get to. There is nothing better than that feeling. That's fantastic. I love that. Uh, yeah, that would be it, I think. If any school listening to this wants to check out Blue Apple Education or perhaps be in touch, where can they go to find out more info, Mark? Yeah, so they can jump on our website, which is uh, blueappleuk.com. Um, we'll put a link on uh, at, at the end of this. Um, and also for anybody that really feels like they're, they're the starting point of, of trying to learn about um, marketing and communications in the school, I run a, um, a branding and identity masterclass every month. And it's something that um, any school can uh, jump on. It's an hour and a half, it's online, and it really is an introduction into school branding and marketing, why it's important. And it gives three key steps to a school to basically help them assess how effective their marketing is being and gives them some pointers as to how they can start to look at improving that. And most of those are... Uh, free to do that they're things that you can just look at and change and, and make some uh, some amendments to the way that you're working so uh, anybody interested in that again there's there's more details about that on our on our website thank you so much for that mark i've really enjoyed talking thank to you so today fun. you've been a brilliant guest and we hope to have you again as a as an expert speaker on the friday club brilliant no thank you so much for your time i've really enjoyed uh answering your your questions i hope i provided enough information for everyone anyway. more than it was really comprehensive and really detailed thank you so much no we'll problem. talk soon mark thank you thanks for your time cheers bye-bye